To begin with, we'll be talking about the differences between analog and digital technology. The difference between analog and digital is pretty clear cut, and today we use mostly digital signals for communication, and we'll see why in just a moment. Now there are two kinds of signal using communication, and you don't get any prizes for guessing what they're called. First of all, we have analog signals. Now analog signals, as we can see, vary smoothly and continuously with time. So these are the sort of things that might look like a mathematical function. We don't ever get jagged edges or points or whatever like that, like that sort of thing. It's always nice and smooth and curved if you zoom in close enough. On the other hand, digital signals look a little bit different. These will jump up and down because they can only take on a certain number of values. They can't take on an infinite number of y values or an infinite number of x values. So it means that we get this little sort of stepping or jumping shapes. In computer terminology, it's what we call aliasing. Now in analog recording, and in analog playback systems, of course, we have a continuously varying signal. Remember, this is the very sort of smooth shape and continuous shape that we get. The recorded waveform, whether it's on an LP disc or a tape cassette or something like that, will exactly match the waveform that it was recording. So if it wants to record a sine wave, then the recording will look like a sine wave. There won't be any jagged edges or aliasing. So the grooves in an LP record, for example, which we can see over here, a bit of old technology, but bear with me, uh, the grooves will move back and forth in exactly the same way that the air pressure in the sound wave moves back and forth. So if you could zoom in and get a microscopic picture of one of the grooves in this LP track, it would be varying up and down exactly in the same way as the sound wave that produced it, and indeed the sound wave that it produces when you play it. In a cassette tape, another piece of fairly outdated technology, we have vibrations of a sound wave encoded on a magnetic piece of tape, which of course is wrapped up inside the cassette. In order to make this conversion, we first represent the sound wave as a voltage. We do this with a microphone. We have a voltage. We can use electromagnetism to turn that voltage into a magnetic field. And this magnetic field is what is encoded on the tape inside the cassette. Because it's analog data, it means the strength of the magnetic field won't suddenly jump up and down. It'll vary continuously. There won't be any aliasing. It'll just be a continuous smooth shape in the same way as the sound wave is a continuous smooth shape. Now, the way that we convert one form of energy to another is with a transducer. A transducer is just any sort of device that will turn one wave into another sort of wave, like a microphone or a loudspeaker. The thing is, they're not perfect. There is no way that we can get a completely accurate copy of any sound. So in order to measure how close the copy is to the original, we use a term called fidelity. And so the fidelity of a waveform, if it's very high fidelity, means that the waveform that you produce is very, very similar to the original waveform. If you have very low fidelity, then it means that the sound that you reproduce is similar in some aspects, but not a completely accurate representation of the original sound. High fidelity sound systems are sometimes called hi-fi sound systems. So fidelity is lowered whenever we transmit the signal or whenever we try to transform it into a different form. That means that if we have to send a signal through a longer distance or through more different changes and conversions between energy types, we end up with a lower fidelity signal. This is particularly important for an analog signal, that is one that varies smoothly and continuously, because if, even if you make one tiny mistake, that'll be encoded in the analog wave. There's no room for error. This is a little different to what happens with a digital signal, but we'll get onto that in a moment. If we look at a digital signal, as we can see, it can only take on certain values, both in the x-axis and in the y-axis. So it is possible to convert an analog signal into a digital signal, like we can see here, by representing the analog signal as a list of numbers. This is useful for computers, for example. Computers work only with numbers, so they only work in digital information. Computers cannot process analog signals. So if we want to feed something into a computer or reproduce a sound from a computer, we need to change it from an analog signal into a digital signal. So to digitize a sound wave, we first 
take the sound wave or the analog wave and we divide it into a number of different segments called samples. So in this case, each sample would be the width of one of these little slices. So you can see that as we go across, we've taken one, two, three, four, five, six, seven samples on each side. And we've taken them all at the same interval. All the samples are the same length. Once we've taken each sample, we look at the amplitude of the analog wave at each part of the sample. And that's what we turn into our digital wave. So a higher sampling rate will produce higher fidelity. If we have a very, very high sampling rate, then that means that all the slices are very, very thin and very, very close together. And instead of getting this sort of aliased, jagged look, we'll end up with all the slices so close together that it will be almost impossible to tell the digital wave from the analog one. So some media that use digital waves in order to store information are more modern methods of storage. Things like CDs, computers, digital radio. Of course, if we're talking about storage, we can also think about things like USB sticks, that is flash memory drives. So the sampling rate of a CD and music recorder on a CD is 44.1 kilohertz. Remember that a hertz is a per second. So 44.1 thousand hertz is 44.1 thousand samples per second. So you can see it's going to be a lot of samples. And in fact, because these samples are so thin and so close together, it's almost impossible to tell that you're listening to a digitized version of an analog recording. It sounds analog to our ears. DVDs have a much higher sampling rate. They can get as high as 192 kilohertz. That is, in every second of sound that you listen to on a DVD, there are 192,000 samples. So in this case, it's just about impossible to tell the difference between the digitized version and the original analog version. This means that DVDs have much higher fidelity than CDs. So higher sampling rates will produce a higher fidelity, and they'll also produce a larger amount of data. Remember that every sample takes up a certain amount of data on the disk or on the flash memory drive or on the hard drive. If we take more samples, that's going to take up more memory. When we're transmitting sound between computers, for example, if you're talking on a headset over Skype, then we want to transfer information very, very quickly. If we take a very, very high sampling rate, then there's too much information and we can't transfer it over computers very quickly. So computer headsets, use a much lower fidelity for their transmission of voice, for example. A lot of headsets sample at about 8 kilohertz, which is much, much lower than that of even a CD. And that's why it's possible to tell when you're listening to someone over a computer that they're not using a very high quality microphone, for example. We can still hear their voice and make out the words, but you wouldn't want to try and listen to high quality audio with this sort of transmission. On the plus side, because it's quite low fidelity and quite a low sampling rate, there's only a small amount of data that we actually have to transmit, which means that the data can be sent in real time and it's possible to have a conversation with someone over the net. So computers use binary digits, that is ones and zeros, to read data. But in the digital recordings that I showed you before, there were a whole number of different levels that the data could be at. It wasn't just ones and zeros. There weren't just two values. There were about you know 16 of them or something like that. If we want to convert a digital signal into binary, that is just ones and zeros, then we simply take the number that the sample represents and we represent it in base two. Now I'm sure you've covered bases in mathematics already, but just a quick refresher. Normally we count in base 10. That means that we count the numbers up until we reach 10. And until we reach 10, all the numbers have a single digit. Once we reach 10, we have two digit numbers. We have a digit in the tens column and a digit in the ones column. In base two, we start counting until we get up to two, and then two is the first two digit number. So then we'll have a one in the two column and a zero in the ones column. Instead of going ones, tens, hundreds, thousands, we go ones, twos, fours, eights, going up by factors of two instead of factors of 10. So numbers in base two have more digits than they have in base 10. If you're trying to represent eight, for example, then in base two, that's four digits long. In base 10, it's still only one. So instead of tens, hundreds, thousands, 
we have ones, twos, fours, eights. We can see a table showing some conversions between base 10 numbers, which we're used to, and base 2 numbers, or binary numbers. So you can see right away that 0 and 1 are going to be the same. But remember, we don't have a separate digit for 2. Instead, we put a 1 in the 2's column. We can see that we're going to move up through the columns very, very quickly. In fact, by the time we get to 15, we're at 1, 1, 1, 1, which means that if we add one more, then 1 plus 1 is going to be 1, 0. So put the 0 down, carry the 1. Then we have another 1 plus 1. That equals 1, 0. So put the 0 down, carry the 1, and it will continue on until we get the number for 16, being 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. So this means that the length of a binary number, in terms of the number of digits, is much longer than a base 10 number. On the other hand, we're only ever using 1s and zeros. The great advantage of this is that if we put these numbers onto a computer, the computer can represent a 1 with an electric current and a 0 by a lack of electric current. So we don't need to worry about the strength of the electric current at all, simply whether it's there or not. So by storing each sample, so each number representing the height of the wavelength, with a 16-digit binary number, in terms of data, that's 2 bytes, then we can store 65,536 different values, which is going to be more than enough for any of the heights that we can think of for an analog signal. So we use an analog to digital converter, which might look something like this, in order to convert the analog signal to the digital signal. And so what it will do is it will take the analog signal, cut it into slices or samples, sample the amplitude at each part and assigning it a number from 0 to 65,000 or so. Once it's done this and it's got a whole list of numbers, it can turn those into binary. So on a CD, if we have a 1 on the CD, then that's represented by a tiny, tiny little pit on the surface of a CD, and a 0 is represented by the lack of a pit. We'll be talking a bit more about this method of storage in a moment. For now, though, we're at the end of the theory. So hopefully now we know a little bit about the difference between analog signals and digital signals, and how digital signals can be turned into binary numbers. 